Jesus said, Man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You're listening to Daily Truth. Esau was not born again. That's why when he seeks the blessing with tears, it's not just that he will not, that he's unwilling to repent, but he cannot. Repentance isn't there. It cannot be found because repentance, again, is not conjured up as a work of man. Repentance is a gift of God that he grants to those whom he chooses. And Esau, God didn't choose. This is what we find in Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Right? One of my favorite verses of the Bible. Um, I remember there was an individual, this is before I came into Reformed theology. But I, I just discovered that it existed, right? Because I didn't, I didn't even know that was really a thing. So I, I was right in that stage where, okay, I know this thing exists. I don't agree with it yet, which means what? It means I hate John Calvin, right? That's pretty, you know, everybody knows the process, right? So you go through a stage where you hate John Calvin because, ah, God's not fair. And then I, I, you know, that's a different gospel. And so I was right there along with anybody else who goes through the process. Um, you, you come into Reformed theology typically, you know, kicking and screaming. And so I was there saying, this isn't fair. I don't like this. And I remember one of my friends who was a Calvinist, who I would argue with relentlessly, um, I remember that he, uh, he was a part of a band, and um, a Christian band, and they would do concerts and things like that, and people would come out with a t-shirt, you know, and want him to sign it, and he would always sign it, Romans 9.13. Which says, and it's like, it's like, really, that's your Bible verse reference? You're going you're gonna to write down all the, you could do John 3, 16, you could do that, you know, Romans 9, 13, which literally states, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Selah. <laughs> you know, like, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Uh, that's the verse you're going to go with? He was like, yeah, that's the verse I'm going to go with because, because it plagues people. And it'll just be gnawing around in their head. And that's what it was for me. I remember listening. I had the Bible on CDs before podcasts and audiobooks and all the. I had the Bible on CD, and I remember listening to Romans 9 on repeat for six months in my dorm room. For six months. Listening multiple times a day to where I had the chapter memorized and listening, hating it. Right? I felt like the Grinch, you know, hearing the, the, the Christmas singing of the Who's and stood up there on Mount Crumpet hating the Who's, you know. So I'm like listening to the Word of God, which is a very, I would not. I would not suggest this. That's, a, that's not a very safe practice um, to, to regularly listen to the Word of God, hating the Word of God. That's where I was at, though. I was like, I do not like this. I do not like this. Um, not one bit. And so I'm listening to Romans 9, and I remember one day, and it's just, and I'm, I'm wrestling with the Lord, uh, trying to, to, to get, get a hold of this. And, and of course, you know, my primary attempt of getting a hold of Romans 9 was to, uh, to, to do, you know, triple, you know, backflip aerial, you know, through this flaming hoop and that one and blah, blah, you know, basically I'm trying to exegete the text to where you completely get rid of the text, right? Have, have you ever seen, like, that's what feminists do, right? Well, technically, 1 Timothy chapter 2, women should learn in quietness and full submission means that women should not learn in quietness and full submission and that men should actually shut up and sit down and learn from women. And it's like, how in the world did you, like, like by the time you're done, and, and this is how you know when someone's perverting the word of God and it's a false exegesis, um, when, when they have to take like 17 steps to get to their exegesis. Like, here's the text. Now, if, if we just wad that up and throw it in a trash bin for a moment, and then if we go and look at Richard Rohr and, 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 and 14 other heretics, we can eventually get back here. And once we take a, you know, a, a metal object and give ourselves a lobotomy, and if we do this and do that, and then submerse ourselves in feminist culture for about 60 years and then come back to the text, can you see how plainly this says that women don't have to submit to men? So I, uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, it took me 50 years to get there, but yeah, I, I guess so. Like, well, that's what I was doing with Romans 9. But I remember all of a sudden, you know, I'm wrestling with God in prayer. I'm listening to Romans 9 on my CD player, you know, and, and doing all this stuff. And I remember one day, and it was, I mean, this is, I had to have heard Romans 9 by this point, had it memorized, heard it oh, well over a, a hundred times, over a six-month period. And I listened to it one day, and, and, and it came to me as sweetness. And it, and, it, and it bothered me. Like, and it actually startled me. I felt uncomfortable. I, I, I felt concerned. I was worried. Because I'm listening to Romans 9, the same chapter that I always listen to with my teeth just a little clenched, you know, and, 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 my, and my pulse probably just a little faster. And then all of a sudden, I'm listening to the, the same chapter, right? My favorite chapter in the Bible to hate, and, and I'm, <laughs> which is just so arrogant, right? So sinful. But I'm listening to it, and I'm like, 
Uh, and, and I did, you know, because it became kind of like this thing that I wasn't even aware of, like almost subconscious. I'm going about, I'm doing things and it's just on in the background and I'm listening and I was like, oh man, that's really good. And I was like, wait a sec, that's really good. What, what did I just say under my breath? What? And, and, and I remember in that moment going to the Lord in prayer, I, I, I turned it off and I was like, I'm liking Romans nine, something, so, there's something broken, something in me snapped, God help me, you know, and I go to the Lord in prayer. And I remember having just this sense from the Lord. It wasn't an audible voice or anything like that, but just a sense from the Lord, Romans 9, 13. And I felt just a sense from the Lord that he was saying, you've always read Romans 9 as Esau, but today by my spirit, I've assured you that you're Jacob. And it turned out that I had no problem. I had no problem with God predestining Esau to hell. That wasn't my problem. I said that's my problem. Well, I just care about equality and fairness for all, equal opportunity. You know, but I, those are all the arguments that I would use. Why well, there can't be true love unless there's free will, and you know all the classic cliche arguments that are are bad arguments. For the record, I don't have time to dismantle everyone today, but just know if that is your argument, it's a bad argument. And then you're like, oh no, that's a bad argument. I got to think about this. So you can spend six months just like I did wrestling, um, but. But ultimately, what it came down to is it wasn't that I was bothered by, by this cosmic definition of fairness, and I didn't think that God was living up to my standard and how I defined this and that. No, what bothered me at the end of the day um, was that I thought I was Esau. I thought that if God didn't choose everyone, then certainly I would be among those that he didn't choose. I would be an Esau. You know, I remember, I mean, this is dumb. I remember thinking, I'm kind of hairy like Esau. I'm probably Esau. You know, like all these, you know, it's just, I'm an Esau. I know I'm an Esau. And then one day I heard Romans 9 as Jacob with just this sense from the Lord by the Holy Spirit working with this text over six months where my heart had changed. My heart had softened. And I had this assurance that I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't really describe. I, 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 I couldn't really give you a basis for it other than it being just a work of God. But I was convinced um, God chose me. Not that merely Jesus died for someone somewhere out there, but that the Son of God loved me, as Paul says in Galatians 2, and gave himself up for me. See, a Christian confession, a Christ, distinctly Christian confession, is a biblical confession. It aligns with what the Scripture says about the person and work of Christ Jesus, but it cannot be merely biblical. A Christian confession is both a biblical confession and a personal confession. That you don't just believe what the Bible says about Jesus, his person and his work, but you believe also that Jesus did this for me. That he died in my place. And that he lived in my place. And that he rose from the dead on the third day as a first fruits, guaranteeing what I will one day receive. That Jesus is my Savior. That he loved me. And he gave himself up for me. That I am Jacob. And that Jacob, being Jacob, like we see, doesn't mean that I'm innocent. It doesn't mean that I'm sinless. But it does mean, it does most certainly mean that I'm righteous. Because I have received the imputed righteousness of Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in him. So we look at the life of Jacob and we say, this isn't, he's not righteous. Oh, yes, he is. At the end of his life, he leaned, well, leaning on, on his staff in worship. J Jacob believed in God. Jacob trusted God. Jacob was a man of faith. The Bible is not saying that Jacob is, is righteous uh, by comparison to his brother, by anything that he did in and of himself. The Bible is saying Jacob is righteous because he was saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Jesus makes us righteous. Jesus makes us righteous. And Jesus did not make Esau righteous. So that just like Judas, Esau through tears seeking the blessing that his younger brother stole. And yet Esau, seemingly the innocent party, the party that was robbed, cannot repent. All right, all right, all right. Stop twisting my arm. I know you want to hear the inside scoop. Here it is. The glorious vision of Right Response Ministries for the first half of next year, 2023. We have not one, not two, but three massive endeavors that we will accomplish by the grace 
of God. The first you already know about. It's our Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference, May 5th, 6th, and 7th, with James White, Joe Boot, Gary DeMar, Dale Partridge, and yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. This is selling out incredibly fast. By the time this commercial airs, you may not even be able to get a ticket. I, I I really don't know. So don't waste another moment. Go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com to join us for the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference next year. Now, this is where you come in. We need your help. Our next two endeavors are number one, a documentary style film, and number two, a brand new studio. Both of these things are seeking to accomplish one primary goal, which is excellent high quality, glorious Christian media. We are tired of, of, as Christians, doing things poorly. We've done our best with what we have, but by God's grace, we want to do even better. This is not going to be just another video. This is not going to be a sermon or an interview or a podcast, but we're going to make a documentary style film. And we're going to be hiring Nathan Anderson, the director of On Earth As It Is In Heaven, a very, very successful post-millennialism documentary that's on Amazon and YouTube, came out a couple years ago. He's going to be flying in from Chile to help us direct this film. And our documentary is going to be on postmillennialism and theonomy, why it's biblically valid, why it's absolutely necessary, and why, by the grace of God, theonomy and postmillennialism are currently on the rise. So we're going to make this film, and we need your support. And not just this film, but we're going to make all of our videos and podcasting and everything we do here at Right Response Ministries better. We want to achieve the highest level of quality and Christian excellence that we possibly can. That's where the new studio comes in. This new film, our, our date that we're shooting for is that it would be complete and publicly available in May or June of 2023, next year. The studio, our goal is that it would be completely done in its construction and the equipment and the setup and the stage and everything by January, February of 2023 next year. We need your prayers. We need your encouragement. And for those of you who are willing to do so, we need your generous support. You can give towards these endeavors by going to rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Again, that's rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Thank you so much for all your help. God bless.